Well, I did mention before I had my little sickness, whatever I had, and uh, that we would go over the Herodian family. Now, I'm not going to go in detail in it. There's many books out there about them. I think I remember, if I remember correctly, and again, I thank Ken for filling in last week, and Eric for preaching, and Ken too. But uh, the Herodian family is probably a good example of a lot of those petty kings back at that time. The prediction in Daniel 2.44 of the kingdom that would reign, that would exist forever, was that in the figure that Nebuchadnezzar, his feet was partly iron and miry clay, indicated partly strong and partly broken. Well, that was a closer prediction to the Roman Empire than most people realized. If you study the Roman Empire, and as it expanded, the way they made peace was to say, uh, you folks be nice folks and don't give trouble to the empire, and we're, we'll be the ones that have the final say in what goes on, but you can take care of your home business, you can have your own religions, and your local affairs you can run as long as they don't uh, threaten the empire, and you'll have the benefit of this whole union and trade and all kind of economic blessings. And then you'll have the protection of the whole Roman army. And that sounded good to folks. And uh, so they were good little boys and girls once they got their heads beat off by the Romans. And uh, after a period of time, they started divvying out as a blessing, I guess you'd say, uh, their Roman citizenship. <clears throat> and that was a very, very special thing. I don't think you could compare it to being a free person in the Constitution of the United States, but it gave you privileges and status that few people in the Roman Empire had. And um, so when you went around through places like um, what we call modern day Turkey or throughout Greece or where um, modern day Bulgaria and Romania and all those places are, they had these little kingdoms that had their own local kings, uh, just like, I say just like, it's the best way I can put it, like the Herods did down around Judea and Galilee and so on, Syria. So it was the way the whole Roman Empire was put together. It was the way the Romans ruled things. It was sort of a, I, I don't know that this is the proper terminology, I doubt it is, but it gives you an idea that the Roman Empire was a very loose confederation that operated under the protection of the general empire, and you were expected to support it no matter what. And that's the reason that if you ever appear to rebel, they took such harsh measures immediately with you if you rebelled. And that's why crucifixion was... Um, uh, was the thing that was decreed for the person who rebelled. When you look at Christ, and we've learned to say he was crucified between two thieves, sometimes we'll say malefactors. In reality, what they were, they were guilty of sedition. That's another reason that you have put up above Jesus's head, Jesus, the King of the Jews, and in three languages. That was another error. Uh, effort on Pilate's part to say, see, I can't find anything wrong with him. They said crucify him. They know him better than I do, and we can't tolerate any sedition, so what does it hurt to do it? And so he put him to death by the instigation of the Jews. And uh, it, it helps. That's the reason Paul wasn't crucified. Paul would have never been crucified. Uh, as a Roman citizen, even though he's worthy of death, because Roman citizens were beheaded. So anyway, the whole of the empire was made up of people like that, and the Herods are just representative of one of those. Um, we'll start back in 65 
BC. Antipater was an Edomian. Uh, where is Edomia? Well, Edomia is basically where Jordan is today. That's very roughly speaking. Have you ever heard of the city of, of Petra? It's the one that has everything. It's a pink looking rock and they've carved all the city out of it. And uh, if you ever saw Indiana Jones and uh, uh, where he's looking for the Holy Grail and all that, that's, they worked all that in there. Some fantastic uh, film, whatever. But anyway, it's over in that area. So you're talking about somebody who's not a Jew. He, like most of these fellows, was a very shrewd politician. And he served as what we would call a vizier under Hyrcanus, the priest whom the Romans had appointed ruler of uh, Palestine. And the Romans went back to calling that Palestine. They basically are the ones that coined it as such. So when he got into that position, then he arranged for his sons by the name of Herod and Phasael to succeed him. And this fellow, Antipater the Edomian, was murdered, which was a common practice among those people. And you notice I said his two sons, Herod and Phasael. Uh, so that's how Herod, who became Herod the Great, came on the scene. Then we come down to the time of Herod the Great, who was in power from 37 to 4 BC. And you have to know something of what was going on in Roman history at this time for him to get into the position that he got into. I suppose about everybody is familiar with the assassination of Julius Caesar. And if you've ever had to in high school or college or somewhere, read uh, Caesar's, or rather uh, Shakespeare's Caesar. You have Mark Antony standing up and delivering his or oration. I came not, come not to praise Caesar, but to bury him, which is not what he did. But anyway, it turned into a uniting Rome to pursue all of those who assassinated Caesar. Well, Herod and Octavius, Octavius being the heir of Caesar, Octavian, who became Augustus, um, he and Mark Antony defeated all these people. Mark Antony uh, pretty well ran Rome there for a little while, while they got everything settled. Then he went out to the east which is always from Greece on to Palestine, Egypt, and so on. And that's when he got involved with a certain woman by the name of Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> by the name of Cleopatra. And Cleopatra had already born Julius Caesar, a child. But anyway, she got all tied up with Mark Anthony. And... Um, while he was in the good graces of things before he and Octavius fell out, uh, Mark Anthony, still with the Roman Senate involved con uh, and confirmed, in other words, Augustus was agreeing with it at the time it happened. And then after the split, Augustus and Mark Anthony in the big civil war, Augustus, Octavian won. Then, um, Mark Anthony had appointed him. The Senate said, that's fine. They couldn't say much else. And then after Mark Anthony is defeated, Augustus says, fine, uh, Herod, you, you stay right in the same position. And uh, really his main contribution to uh, the Jews was that he built the temple. And he got it built just about, 10 years before the Romans destroyed it under Titus in AD 70. But if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that uh, they make reference to that 
in several places where Jesus is talking to them. And they talk about how long this temple was being built and so forth. And you see the disciples talking about how beautiful a place it was. Well, Herod the Great never did feel like that he was accepted by the Jews. So he was doing everything possible to say, please like me. But uh, that didn't work too well with the Jews. Now, we call him bloodthirsty. We call him cruel. And he was. But he was one among a lot of others scattered throughout the Roman Empire. You remember he killed the babes in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, a younger trying to do, destroy Jesus. And without going into detail, he murdered some of his wives and his children. If you got in his way, then you suffered the fate of those um, little babes in Bethlehem. I suggest sometime you look up and just read more about him. He died a pretty horrible death, but anyway... After him, Archelaus ruled from 4 B.C. to 6 A.D., and he was the son of Herod, of course, by a woman, his wife, Malthasy. She was a Samaritan. And Archelaus and the Romans were trying to come up with titles for folks is they divided up the empire or divided up Herod the Great's rule, make everybody happy by giving them some sort of vice presidency. And uh, he was Tetrarch of Galilee. I mean, sorry, Ethnarch. I get my Tetrarchs and Ethnarchs mixed up. He was Ethnarch of Judea. And he too was as cruel as his uh, father. And the Romans had enough of him finally banished him. But then we come now to Herod Antipas, 4 BC to 39 AD. In other words, he came into his, his inheritance at the same time that his brother did, Archelaus. He uh, was a full brother, that is Herod Antipas to Archelaus, same mother. And he was Tetrarch of Galilee in Perea. Now, he is the one who unlawfully took and married Herodias. And it doesn't say that the scriptures, because the Jews didn't look at it this way, uh, who was his brother Philip's wife. Well, Philip was a half-brother. He was son of Mariamne, another wife of Herod the Great. And you might have to have a, some sort of scorecard to know who belongs to who and who's doing what. He's the one that murdered John the Baptist because of the reason we all know. He is also the one that Jesus stood before in trial in Luke 23, 5 through 12. Luke 23, 5 through 12. And then a character by the name of Caligula came to the throne and he banished him. That is, Caligula banished Herod Antipas. So, Uneasy is the head that wears a throne. Yeah, well, a crown. It wouldn't, it would be an uneasy head if it wore a throne. Anyway, Herod Philip, then the second, uh, who 4 BC, 4 BC to 34 AD, he was the son of, of Cleopatra. Herod and Cleopatra. And he married his niece, Herodias, who later left him for his half-brother Antipas. And he's mentioned in Hebrews 3 and verse 1 as Tetrarch of Euteria. Now, as I say, when you're reading Herod in the New Testament, it doesn't always mean just one Herod. And you have to kind of get an idea about looking at who's doing what and having some sort of knowledge of the family to know who's doing, who's doing what at what time to whom. Now, we're familiar with Herod Agrippa I from 37 to 
44 AD. He was the son of Bernice and Aristobulus, the son of Herod the Great. So he was um, ruled the Tetrarchy of Philip, Judea, Perea, and Galilee. He is the one who killed James the brother of John with the sword and then took Peter, but he saw that pleased the Jews, Acts 12, one through three. He's also the one who took all the glory to himself and thought he's some great person. The Lord struck him, he died of worms, Acts 12, 19 through 23. And the last one is Herod Agrippa II. Herod Agrippa II from 50 to 93 AD. Of course, he was son of Herod Agrippa I and Herodia. I all like to get some name, whether it's female or male, it had Herod in it. He ruled the former, former Tetrarchy of Philip and Lysanias and part of Galilee and Perea. He is the one who heard Paul's defense in Acts chapter 25. 13 through chapter 26, verse 32. Now, you can see why I said that it can get rather confusing and you almost have to have a chart to be able to follow these fellows if you're that interested in it. And it gets even more interesting than that. I might mention here that we don't realize in a lot of ways how much history has come down to us. And yet there's even far more loss to us. But we have enough history coming down to us to have this kind of a record of the Rhodian family. I'll mention this one other thing in passing. When we can date these fellows, and we read Luke writing what he did about, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John writing what they did about which Herod doing what, that helps us uh, date certain books, certain times as to when Paul was doing whatever he did or whoever did what. So that's all I'm going to do on that. You can get more details. There are umpteen books written on the Herodian family. But um, I dare say after that, you won't remember who did what anyway. And uh, except maybe on a few of them. Okay, I would like to move into the final gospel account. The Gospel of John, we pointed out that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic books in that they begin and end and follow through the same approach in dealing with things. Each one of them does that. But John uh, doesn't do that. John basically, once he gets the introduction out of the way, John basically calls witness after witness after witness. And in doing that, he records some things the others don't, proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He actually sets out his proposition in the first uh, three verses. If you want to add verse 14 onto that too. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. Then when you go to 14, and the word became flesh, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, those are the key verses as far as I'm concerned, at least the first of, of two, of John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 14, that basically establishes, here's my premise. Here's what I'm going to prove. But then when you look at John 20, this will be the second of key verses. And, and I know all of you are familiar with this. John 20, 30, and 31. Uh, many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. Of course, that is simply saying that these are written. 
what is in the, what has been recorded in this book by me have a reason for being written and what is it that ye may believe believe what that jesus is the christ christ meaning anointed one appealing back to old testament where they anointed priests and where they anointed kings as official sign they are who they are and then he adds to it the son of god in the mind of the Jew, son of anybody made you on an equality with that person. Uh, when it said that Jesus was the son of a carpenter, that meant that he was a carpenter. When uh, Jesus said he was a son of man, then that meant he's human. And when he said he's the son of God, that meant he is God. Now, you'll notice when he confessed he was the son of God before the Pharisees and others, they pitched a wall-eyed fit and tore their clothes and all that. Now, the reason why is you didn't say that except you're saying, yeah, he's God and I am too. <laughs> That's what that actually said. And they, you know, hey, light need we have witnesses. We have heard it from his own mouth. So they weren't interested in the proofs that said what he just said is the truth. They just didn't like it. Didn't fit their bailiwick, so they jumped right in the middle of things. So we've got those two verses. Again, you can pick out many others, but reducing them down just to two. John 1, 1 through 3, and verse 14, and John 20, verses 30 and 31. There's two key verses. A lot of everything else just fits right in between all of those. Um. Look, okay, there's another thing I want to say about that, but I can't think of it right now. The word believe, yeah, I know what I want to say. The word believe is used 98 times in John's book. Go back to John 20 and 30, 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God. Now, what was John writing? He was giving evidence. You know, Paul told us plainly in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things. Oh, fast that which is good. That's what John's doing. His book is proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Notice, this does not rule out knowledge. This demands correct knowledge. Now, this same John, in writing his first epistle, We'll talk about hereby we know, hereby we know. And I can't remember now, it's been a while since I counted it, but I think it's about 24 times that he says something like hereby we know. If your knowledge of Jesus is not right, your belief in Jesus cannot be right. Proper knowledge of Jesus is necessary if your faith in Jesus is to be what is required to save your soul. Thus, when Jesus said to the Jews, except, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, he was saying when you consider the evidence that can point to only one thing and you still refuse to believe, there's no hope for you. This destroys the idea that there's empirical knowledge, and that's the only kind of knowledge there is. And that when you say you have belief in something or faith in something, then you jump beyond empirical knowledge and you just have a high a wish that what you're concluding is true. That is a false concept of faith. For faith to be correct, it must be built upon adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Now, with that in mind, you read John. And he not only selects witnesses who were happy to believe that Jesus is Son of God, but he selects those also who didn't necessarily believe him. But the evidence compelled them to accept him. Now let's just pick one we all know. I grew up 
being taught what a terrible thing is that Thomas doubted. Oh, doubting Thomas. What was wrong with Thomas? That's not right. We do him a great disservice. You know what Thomas is saying? That you can provide the adequate evidence, I'm not going to believe. And you shouldn't either, and I shouldn't either, and we shouldn't expect anybody else to. Because what happened with Thomas when he experienced the adequate evidence? What was the first thing out of his mouth? My Lord and my God. Why? The evidence was so compelling there wasn't anything else for an honest-hearted person to do. And if Annas and Caiaphas and that crowd had had the heart that the apostles did, especially to, uh, Thomas, they would have done the same thing. But even when they admitted he did a miracle, they said, well, he does it by the devil. There was nothing honest about those people. They were just plain mean, put it nicely. So when you study John, you're studying adequate evidence and credible witnesses that the honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, says that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes from the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Notice that's in John. And therefore, you're without excuse not to believe him. So I suggest that you realize that when you have the empirical evidence, let's take another example. Well, no, let's just take the same example. Let's take Thomas beholding the nail scars in his hands and his side and so forth. And his honest conclusion, my Lord and my God. But when you think about that, and you go out here and preach the truth, of the gospel, then it would produce the same thing in the other person in an honest and good heart and would listen to it and understand it. And that's the thing that gets overlooked by so many people. We try to figure out every way under the sun to get somebody to be baptized, but we really need to get them to believe and repent. You can't keep a person out of the water for the right reason if he's believed and repented. You can't do it. You'll notice in the book of Acts, as the gospel has begun to be carried through the world, they never argue over whether you must be baptized to be saved or whether you're saved at the point of faith only. You won't find that there. What you do find is establishing that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Every time an honest-hearted person had proven to him or her that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God, never, not one time, do they ever question whether they had to be baptized for the mission of sin. Not one time. The struggle in those days was at the point of belief. Now, what, what did John, what did we learn about John as to why he wrote this book. Well, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God. Then when you add on to that what is said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Remember what a disciple is, follower or learner. And notice he says you're my disciples indeed. Sometimes that gets used as sort of really not thinking about it meaning anything, but Indeed means in actuality, in your practice. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the battle was proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You'll remember when Paul stood before Agrippa II, He said, uh, you are going, you're trying to uh, get me to be a Christian. Paul's response was, well, no, really, I'm defending myself. I don't want to go to jail. Well, we know that wasn't what he said. He said, I, I would have you be a Christian, 
as fully persuaded as I am and be just like I am, except these chains. So what was Paul doing? He was trying to persuade everybody who came along. Adequate evidence, credible witnesses that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Savior of the world. And you'll remember that he had appeals to Agrippa when he gets through going over all these things of the Old Testament, things pertaining to John the Baptist. And he says, I know you know these things. They weren't in the corner. So he appeals to things that could be established. So when we preach the word, then we're preaching evidence. That's the reason we don't want to deviate from the word. We want to be sure that we're teaching a rightly divided word, 2 Timothy 2.15. And that's the reason James said, don't be many masters. You know, we all the time trying to get more teaching. Well, I've wondered about that all my life. Some of the people that call themselves teachers, you know, you can't teach what you don't know. You just can't do it. And some of the people that occupy rooms call themselves teachers. It better be very careful, and that includes preachers, anybody else, because James has put it this way, we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, why? If you don't offer the evidence, if you don't teach it like it is, then you're going to lead somebody the wrong direction. But I would close on this point by emphasizing, and I will throughout the time as it comes to mind, the importance of knowing that once you have the facts in a case, you can reason from those facts and expand your knowledge beyond the facts in the case. You come to knowledge in two ways, the assimilation of the facts, such as when you read John, you'll see that. But then reasoning from those facts expands your knowledge beyond those facts. So in a court case today where you have a jury, it is the preponderance of the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that you bring in a verdict of guilty. Because all the evidence weighs guilty. And that's the way it is with us today. There's not anything said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that if you don't want to, you can figure out a way to say, oh, well, that doesn't mean that, or that doesn't mean this. Because you see, the gospel tests your integrity. It tests your honesty. It tests, even as Christians, you're tested, will I do this solely because of it's authorized by the New Testament? Or will I do only that part of the New Testament that I like real well, but if I don't see something over here that suits me too well, then I'll do as I please. That's going to follow us all the days of our life because there's no other way to prove you're faithful other than that way. Okay, key verses, chapter 1, 1 through 3 and 14, and chapter 20, 30, 31, and that he used the word believe 98 times, and uh, he chose witnesses and adequate evidence to prove his case. And thus we come to the key concept of the book that Jesus of Nazareth is the eternal and divine word of God. Come down from heaven, becoming a man and living as men in a fleshly body for a given purpose and a given end. So that's an important point to keep in mind. That concept flows all the way through the book of John. Well, a little bit about the author and some time we got remaining. He is the son of Zebedee, an apostle of Jesus Christ. His name is not affixed to the letter either or this gospel account. But I don't know how anybody can read through it understanding the difference in explicit in just so many words and implicit and not see that the explicit material in John implies that John the Apostle wrote it. 
So I think by his name in this case being omitted from the book actually serves as as one of the points, not all, but one of the points that John the Apostle wrote it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I'll pause here and say this. James, who wrote the book of James, and Jude, who wrote the little one chapter book, are half brothers in the flesh, flesh to Jesus. You'd never know it by reading the book. Never, 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 never do they ever say, look, I, I grew up with that guy. He's my brother in the flesh. Because if you were a half-brother in the flesh to a Jew, you were a brother. You will never read them referring to Jesus in a fleshly relationship. You will always read both of those men referring to him just like all the other writers of the New Testament as a son of God and worthy of all that that term means and i think then when you come to john the apostle you have him saying things like uh, that he was the disciple whom jesus loved he says that five times chapter 13 verse 23 chapter 19 verse 23 and chapter 21 20. i don't think you can say that he used that because he had a big ego but he's stressing the message. I've said all along, it didn't make any difference what human hand God inspired to write the truth of God on this earth infallibly. And in this case, John the Apostle is stressing the message, the message. And it came from one so close personally to the Lord, one who was one of the inner three with Jesus. So he doesn't call his name. He just says, he loved me. He's described as the other disciple, chapter 18, 15, 16, chapter 20 and verse 2, and chapter 21 and verse 2. Now, the so-called church fathers did attribute the gospel of John to John. A fellow by the name of Theophilus of Antioch from, who lived from one, who wrote from 170 or 180, somewhere along in there, identified John the Apostle as the writer. Irenaeus wrote, and I quote from him, Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during the residence, during his residence at Ephesus, unquote. And then Clement of Alexandria wrote that, quote, John, the last of all, seeing that uh, what was corporal was set forth in the, his term, gospels, on the entreaty of his intimate friends and inspired by the Spirit, composed the spiritual gospel. That's from his Ecclesiastical History, chapter 6 and verse 14. Um, we have in the library, for those that want to wade into it, the anti Nicene fathers and the post Nicene fathers, and that's the way they usually measure the so-called apostolic fathers as to when they wrote because they're referring to Nicaea in the sense of the Nicene Creed. So you got those called church fathers before there was a Nicene Creed, and you got those who wrote after the Nicene Creed, and that's the way uh, church history has come to record them. Uh, H.C. Thiessen, or Thyssen, it's German, it's Thyssen, but if it's American, it's decent. Said this, and I quote, the external evidence for the early date and apostolic authorship of the fourth gospel is as great as that for any book of the New Testament. Um, of course, as I said to you all earlier about liberal theologians, and by liberal here we mean those who are modernists who don't really 
accept the miracles of the Bible and might have no telling how many writers of Isaiah and so forth. But uh, they've just been hostile, hostile uh, against John the Apostle being the writer. But my view is, as a rule of thumb, you have to go further than this, as a rule of thumb, anytime those guys start opposing something, that makes me want to look into it that even more. Had a, yeah, well, Kevin, you're here. I had your grandfather tell me many years ago that when he heard a lot of people talking real bad about somebody, it just made him want to go sit down to that person and talk to him and get firsthand information on his side of the matter because many times it meant that guy was a great guy. <laughs> I've always remembered that. So we need to have the facts at hand. And um, we need to be doing our homework when it comes to that kind of matter on anything that pertains to another person in report we receive, and that includes Jesus. When you hear these preachers get on television and they say this, that, and the other, and the Holy Spirit told me to do thus and so, and the Holy Spirit told me to do that. I got very, it was very humorous to me the other day, somebody, one of these so-called faith healers, one of these charlatans, said he would be glad when the uh, COVID-19 problem was over so they could get back to the work that they had been doing. Well, he claims to be able to work miracles, let him solve the whole thing in a split second. He can go back to whatever he was doing. But that just goes to show you. I was down in Florida one time and traveling down the road, and I looked up at a marquee. It is one of these so-called faith healer places. And on the marquee, it said, regular times and announced for services. Then right at the bottom, mind you, this is one that claimed miracles. They work miracles. It says services for the deaf at 5 p.m. Now, you know, people that can't see through that, I don't know what you can do with them anyway. But it's 8.15 right now, and we'll pick up on some of this and look a little more about the author as the Bible pictures John the Apostle in our next time around. So we'll, we'll stop here with that. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to talk about them a minute.